know that they're, they're carrying adults who are around them to help them understand a little bit. We know this even in scripture that Philip would come across somebody and ask, uh, was asked to help interpret what he was reading. Today's scripture readings that are listed there in your worship bulletin and a space for you to take notes if you desire to are a little bit like that because we have a parable of Jesus. The important thing to know about a parable is it is a made-up story with made-up characters, a made-up setting, a made-up, not completely made-up premise, but this is not a historical account that Jesus is sharing with people. This is a parable. The beautiful thing about parables is although they don't change over time, we do. And so we enter parables at different times in our life. The way I read a parable today might be very different than the way I read it three years ago or 10 years ago. Where I find myself in the parable might be different three years from now or 10 years from now. What's important is that Jesus is always constantly teaching through these parables so that, th that we grow along with them. And so part of that is in this parable that we hear from the Gospel of Luke. This comes to us in Luke just in the midst of Jesus doing a bunch of teachings, largely with uh, the leaders and those who are around him, oftentimes with the Pharisees that Jesus is trying to give them some new indication about what their life with God could be like. So I'm going to read this parable from the Gospel of Luke in the 16th chapter. I'm going to start at verse 19 where Jesus is teaching and he says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony." Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. Um, cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us, he said. Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. The gospel of the Lord. So we hear this parable, and we might want to jump to easy conclusions. That is, oh, Jesus is teaching us about heaven and hell here. So Jesus is teaching us in heaven we are with the angels and in hell we are in torment. And that can be some place where you are in, in your life and you might want to jump into the parable that way. I would say I don't think that was Jesus' intention in this parable. I don't think Jesus was trying to teach us about what heaven will be like or what hell will be like. I think most of Jesus' parables try to teach us what earth is like, try to teach us about what things are like right now. And so in the midst of that parable, he starts talking about what he sees around him. He sees very wealthy people, and he sees very poor people. And he's trying to make some sense of that for all of the people. And so he, he gives this parable as a way for us to recognize that we're in the midst of disparity in our world, some with very, many, with very much and, and some with very little. But I think 
most importantly, he's simply asking us to, to see each other. He's simply asking us to, to see each other for who we are. He has wonderful imagery when he starts talking about this parable, about the rich, rich man who feasted sumptuously, you know, that, that he brings all of that out. And then he talks in a little bit about what happens when they die, that the poor man is carried off by the angels. You almost want to hear a harp kind of play in the background as Jesus tells us that. And the rich man died and was buried. It just sort of summarily lets us know that. But once he's laid that out, to me, I think what he's really trying to teach us is the danger of a chasm. And what he lays out in this story is that chasm has grown to the point where it may not be repaired unless people really start seeing. It wasn't until that chasm was there that the rich man ever even saw Lazarus. He never really saw Lazarus, because what we heard is Lazarus just longed to feed himself with what fell from the rich man's table, but apparently the rich man didn't even see him enough to share even the scraps with him. And the chasm started to grow. And then the rich man wants to do something very basic. Just send someone back from the dead to warn his brother so that they don't continue growing that chasm. And Jesus says, let them listen to Moses and the prophets. Oh, this makes me wonder. What did the prophets have to say about all of this? Well, there was a prophet, Amos, who was in the southern kingdom of Judah, who was asked to go to the northern kingdom of Israel. Not an easy task to go into sort of enemy territory and bring a prophecy to the rich and the wealthy in the northern kingdom of Israel. But this is what Jesus said are the words that we should be listening to even today. So Gretchen, will you read for us that passage from Amos as he talks to the people of Israel. The prophet Amos announces that Israel's great wealth is a cause not for rejoicing, but rather sorrow, because God's people have forgotten how to share their wealth with the poor. From Amos 6, verse 1a. Alas for those who are at ease in Zion and for those who feel secure on Mount Samaria. Alas for those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall who sing idle songs on the sound of the harp and like David improvise on instruments of music who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they shall now be the first to go into exile, and the revelry of the loungers shall pass away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. talking and giving this parable, he's basically saying to the people, those prophets who spoke long ago, they're still speaking. They're still talking to you. And so they might recount these very words of Amos as he was sent to the people of Israel. And in that day again, they would have seen this disparity between the very wealthy and the very poor. But it's interesting, Amos does not say that's what's wrong. We could read it that way if we missed one little important phrase in the midst of that. He talks about all of the things that the wealthy have at first. Of course, their ivory beds and so forth. I, I went to Furniture Row last week to buy an ivory bed. They didn't have any left. Uh, and, and, but then they, they also, they feast the way the, the rich man in the parable did. And they drink wine from bowls. It's like a wine glass cannot hold everything. So they're drinking wine from bowls. Uh, the way Amos points this out to them. But he says they do all this, and that's not the problem. The problem is when they do this, they are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Taking us back to 
Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, taking it back to slavery in Egypt and being brought out of slavery and now in the land that God promised them, a land where if they followed God's laws, everyone would have enough and everyone would be able to participate in God's abundance. And that's what's not happening It wasn't so much that some people had and some people hadn't, is that they stopped seeing each other the way God sees them. They stopped caring for each other the way God wanted them to care for each other. And now Jesus is seeing the same thing in his day. And so he says to them, you have Moses, you have the prophets, you have the word that's been coming to you all along. Start listening and start seeing the people around you the way God sees them. I don't think Jesus ever had any any false hopes that there wouldn't be wealthy and there wouldn't be poor. And I don't know what we could do with our social systems and our religious systems and our government systems to ever prevent that from happening. But this we have the power to do. We have power to see people the way God sees them. We have the power to to share some of what we have. And if we have an abundance, we'll hardly notice it ourselves. But somebody else will be given We'll be given a new sense of life, a new sense of love and hope in their lives. It doesn't start if we say, let's take what the rich have and give it to the poor and even it all out. That'll never happen. That'll just never happen. What can happen is we decide decide to look at somebody the way God looks at them. We decide to love someone the way God loves them. We realize that Moses and the prophets are still speaking to us today. And we realize that if gone untouched, a chasm could grow beyond our repair. But maybe it's not Yet, if I can still look across at somebody who may be very different than me, if I can still see them, then that chasm has a chance to close a little bit, to become a little bit smaller. And once I see them, I might have the opportunity to reach out to them. And when that happens, then maybe what is extended from me to them and from them back to me is nothing more than God's love. It's nothing more than God's love. It starts when we choose to simply see. See the people around us the way God sees them. Amen.